Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the session, Attacking and Defending Kubernetes TE Enclaves and Critical Infrastructure. My name is Robert Ficalia. I'm the co-chair of the Kubernetes Policy Workgroup and a member of the CNCF Security Tag, have led some uh, security assessments in that group, and I'm also uh, assisting with Kubernetes third-party audit. Um, in my day job, I work with uh, high security critical systems, things in payments, banking, healthcare, uh, and government. And of course, I've um, enjoying the Spanish hospitality, as I hope you all have as well. So what is a TE? When, when they assigned me the auditorium, uh, I assume that uh, lots of people were coming for a free t-shirt. But we're not talking about T's in that sense. We're talking about trusted execution environments. These are hardware-enabled enclaves that allow you to protect your code and data while in use. So many of you are probably familiar with the concept of protecting data at rest on disk storage and in uh, data stores. In transit, TLS, your TCP IP sockets protected by encryption and integrity. Here we're talking about actually making sure the code that is executing in the CPU is protected, isolated, and the data is encrypted. Just to show a hands, how many of you are familiar with what TEEs or enclaves are? So a few, a few. Uh, any of you using those in production today? No, so more uh, the experimental stage. I think that's the norm. Oh, I lost my. So those of you who may have done attack modeling, uh, threat modeling, or even trust modeling, will at some point start making assumptions, documenting those assumptions. And if you're operating in user land, usually you're making assumptions like, I can trust my hardware provider. I can trust my chip manufacturer. I can trust my cloud provider. I can trust my sysadmin, my root users who are employed and background checked. But what if you can't? Who would, who would need this level of trust and integrity? Well, we're talking about critical energy infrastructure, well, really any uh, critical physical infrastructure systems, uh, defense, military systems. Uh, if there's a large financial uh, opportunity, then you may be storing value in the billions of dollars, and so it becomes a high-value target. So that's the audience we're really addressing today. Those are the attackers that we're interested in, and those of us who are defending, those are the environments that we're defending. Uh, I mentioned some of the use cases, but I think where TEs and enclaves really got their, their start was enabling a more scalable version of what had already been used for a decade plus, things uh, that were hardware-based and rooted a, a trust chain so that you as a developer could deploy code in a, in a secure way. But that was very hardware-specific. It was often dedicated hardware modules you might plug into a server, or it was a, a specific board in a client desktop or laptop. And so this was a way to really scale this up to cloud and, and make these more virtual. Uh, but in general, you can also use this to increase your compliance posture. And we'll talk about a little about that at the end. Uh, and if you're dealing in a regulated environment, GDPR, of course, is a common topic for us today, uh, operating in the EU, then you might want to have a way to uh, prove that you are protecting that user data uh, from the uh, cloud provider itself. And then again, as we get into blockchain and smart contracts, if you want to protect intellectual property during machine learning and you want to be able to use data that's not yours and, you do, or, you, and or you don't want to disclose your algorithms, these are all use cases for uh, hardware-based encryption, hardware-based isolation. Um, and so that's a quote from the confidential computing folks. You're basically trying to remove as much of the attack surface as possible uh, down to the, as close to the hardware as you can get. So if we take a, a quick deeper dive into what exactly this means at hardware level, it's really a special set of registers and, and opcodes at the CPU level that's interacting with uh, usually a, a memory protection coprocessor or, or unit on the CPU. And it's enabling the, the separation of a trusted area in memory, usually enabled at the BIOS level and then in a small amount of microcode and uh, that allows you to marshal calls between a trusted region of memory, an encrypted region of memory, and 
then outside of that enclave, you can pass secrets in, you can get secret data out, encrypted, and it's unique to that processor, right? So you know you're operating in a particular environment and that you can, you can verify that. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So it's authenticated. As the data is passed in, it is now confidential. And even at the code level, you can be assured that the code itself has been checked for integrity, that no one has tampered with it. It's exactly the code that you expect. So there are many, well, there are a few chip implementations. Uh, by far, the largest is uh, Intel's implementation, SGX, and they have some newer capabilities, TDX, uh, which we can talk about a little bit later. I am not affiliated with Intel or any chip manufacturer. I'm not affiliated with any Enclave or TEE software provider. I have no horse in this race. I am essentially an operator, uh, probably like many of you, looking for a way to solve a particular problem. And, and SGX is one implementation that's widely available. ARM and others are, are making progress. But if you look at how that memory encryption works, you've, you've got some reserved memory, and you've got pages of memory in a, in a lookup protected in, in the microcode, uh, a lookup table. And then anytime you deploy an enclave, and any of that reserved memory space for your enclave is managed in a, in a cached uh, array so that you have a mapping between what pages are being used and how they are assigned to each enclave. Uh, so an important part of how you establish this trust is that you need to know that the code and that metadata, there's some cryptographic keys for that encryption, there's cryptographic keys embedded into the hardware unit to establish that root of trust by the manufacturer. You need a way to measure, to attest, that everything is exactly as you expect. And so you're using things like cryptographic, cryptographic hashing and asymmetric encryption. So you're hashing all the information, the metadata on the chip. You're hashing the, the state of, kind of a, a bootstrap set of enclaves on the chip, a provisioning enclave, a signing enclave, and you're able to, to then know as the client uh, in the untrusted space whether you're operating in an environment that you expect. Um, so typically on the hardware, they'll have special e-fuses that will in, uh, enable that root key, and then typically there's a derivation, key derivation function, so you're kind of using key encryption keys, and then eventually when you call these trusted functions to, to pass things in and out of uh, untrusted space, you're using those derived keys. So when you, when you initialize an enclave securely, you've, you're passing in secrets and keys from outside. You're doing this attestation process. So you're saying that uh, if two enclaves on the same CPU need to communicate with each other, that they know that each of those are, uh, have not been tampered with and have integrity, and have an identity. And then if you need to uh, attest to some global registry so that you can move data across CPUs, then you're usually attesting to something like an Intel uh, registry. And that's why they've embedded their public key in the, in the chip so that you can make that secure connection to Intel and verify. Um, there's a, on the chip, there's a component. We, talked a little bit about a provisioning enclave to kind of bootstrap all this. There's usually something, a quoting enclave, that manages that verification to, to the global registry. Um, so data, you need to have data that you've operated on in the enclave. You need to somehow persist that outside the enclave. And that's where SGX and, and others, ARM, have a scheme for sealing the data. And then that way, you can call special routines that will allow you to encrypt it with a key that you know came from the enclave, persist it outside of the enclave, and then be able to restore it back into the enclave and use it for later. Otherwise, if, you, if you're only operating on very small amounts of data, um, you might not need this. But any, any practical application, we're dealing with machine learning, um, blockchains, et cetera, you're probably going to need to seal data and, and persist it outside of the enclave securely. Uh, although I will note that newer generations of uh, SEX chips do you have expanded uh, memory? It used to be limited to you know, a very small amount. Now it, I think it can go up to a terabyte. Uh, let's see. So 
how, how do, practically, how do we make use of this? Um, you have a few options. You can kind of handcraft your code, re-architect your application to use only those specific O calls and E calls, these trusted entryways into the enclave between untrusted and trusted. You can try to wrap it. You can, there's some code that we'll talk about that will allow you to convert your existing code into enclave-ready code. And then kind of a newer option is to use things like WASM to create bytecode, and that, that can be used across TE architecture, so you get a little bit more portability. And the idea is that you're getting uh, the application you have today, you're just cross-compiling that. So those of you who might be fans of Casa de Papel, <laughs> I like to put myself in the mentality of what would the professor do? So uh, probably he wouldn't go for direct assault through the front door, so you wouldn't attack the boundary directly, although you might use that as a form of misdirection. You would probably try to attack every part of the supply chain. You'd probably attack uh, the personnel involved, the cloud provider. You'd probably attack uh, the provider hardware uh, systems integration. So interesting uh, reports in the last couple of months from some startups doing work on looking at components on a board found that a vast majority of them have fakes. So you're getting a bill of materials. It says it's from this manufacturer or that manufacturer. And you realize, nope, it's, it's been tampered with or it's you know, something off of a different market. Um, and it's been repackaged to look like the chip you're expecting. Um, so you're highly motivated attacker for a high value target is going to make no assumptions, right? They're going to assume that all parts of this system are attackable and they're gonna spend the time and the resources to do that. So it's patient research and it's not, not something that can be uh, accomplished with uh, you know, kind of an academic exercise. So to enable all that memory encryption, the supervision of those O calls and E calls in and out of the enclave, uh, CPU, cache control, where memory is, how memory is laid out, you've got to have a lot of features. And then to build on top of that, you've got to have you know, firmware, you've got microcode, you've got to have kernels and operating systems and drivers, and then inside of your application that you've now somehow enabled for Enclave, you've got this whole set of code, all of which would be part of the trusted computing base or attack surface, if you look at it from the uh, perspective of an attacker. So a, a big part of some of the shortcomings of enclaves is that they are susceptible to side channel attacks. So you can measure the, the timing, you can measure the, the rhythm, the cadence of operations, and then you can uh, baseline good versus bad. You can tease out bits of a secret key just by measuring the kind of thermodynamics of what's happening over time. Uh, and so you know, we'll talk a bit about some of the defenses at the end. But that is a, a, an ongoing concern, and the chip manufacturers continue to layer on every generation uh, defense techniques for side channels. So I just, I'm not going to go into the detail of what, what this attack tree looks like, but just to, to put out there the idea that every one of those CPU caches, the bus caches, the BIOS, all of these have attacks that are documented either academically or in... in um, uh, some open source literature. So it's, it's not a given that just because it's in hardware, it's secure. I think if, if you take away one thing today, that you know, trust is, is very difficult in these types of systems. Um, you know, do you trust something because it comes in a box and has an Intel logo? Uh, do you trust it because you hire a third party evaluation? You, I mean, and in smart cards and some phone manufacturers, they go through a certification process with labs. Um, is that trustworthy? Uh, maybe it's like risk, and you put out all the designs for the hardware, for all the and open source all the code. Is that enough to, to be trusted, or are enough uh, reasonably educated folks looking at that code in a meaningful way, or do you just rely on standards bodies and talks like this to uh, make your own decision? What I what I think I would have you come away with today is it's not a silver bullet. So I've I've heard some high-level hand-waving that if you put everything in the TE, then you don't have to worry about X, Y, Z. That somehow it's bestowed this magic that because it's in a TE, no other controls are required and it's perfectly secure. I think I would definitely take this uh, away today that that is not the case. That you do have to be, if anything, more concerned 
and scrutinize more exactly what is going into your trusted computing base and try to minimize that attack surface. Uh, all those knobs and levers that we looked at in implementing this memory segmentation, memory isolation, uh, they offer attack points. So where does Kubernetes fit? So we're here at a, a KubeCon. Obviously, we're all interested in how Kubernetes can use this technology. Um, so the, the most obvious way to think about this is at the container level, at the pod level. We want to deploy our workloads somewhat easily into Kubernetes. We, in talking about that attack surface, you probably don't want to bring the entire Kubernetes control plane into that trusted computing base because, again, any, any flaw in that trusted computing base is exploitable, is attackable. So you really want to constrain down to the most useful unit. And for all of us in the Kubernetes environment, that would ideally be the pod. So that's, I think, we're going to focus most of our attention. Um, now, if you're trying to operate this, you already have a tough job operating Kubernetes as it is. Now, as a DevOps person, you may be required to restructure your application, re-architect, maybe cross-compile things. You have to worry about how TEs are communicating. Do you put, are you assigning workloads to the right nodes? Are you putting the right uh, hardware? Do you have a mix of CPU nodes? Do they have the right feature flags in the BIOS? So, um, it, it gets very, very difficult very, very quickly. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about some open source help. Um, and this is, again, I'm not affiliated with any of these projects. Uh, so this is just a menu of options that are out there. Um, some I've, I've used, some I haven't. Um, so open enclave. So I'd, I'd look at this as your first step. So if you're, you know, right above just taking the SDKs from the chip manufacturer and using their utilities, Open Enclave adds an, a layer of abstraction, right? So they're trying to get multi-TE support, cross-OS support. Um, when you're developing four enclaves from just the SDKs, you have a lot of responsibility. The crypto libraries that they distribute are usually marked as not for production. Uh, they may not have you know, passed FIPS. Uh, you, you don't get any operating system, so you have to produce libraries of your own or uh, use existing libraries that have been uh, tested on these enclaves. So Open Enclave gives you a lot of that functionality at a kind of an SDK abstraction and makes it possible to do more powerful things. In fact, most of what we'll talk next in some way or another either uses Open Enclave directly or has learned a lot from Open Enclave and, and mirrored some of their approaches. Um, so uh, the next level of abstraction is you can kind of wrap your uh, application into a unikernel lib OS, uh, basically you're creating a process. So instead of having a modular OS with kernels, drivers separated, you're kind of taking the exact opposite route. Uh, you're compiling everything into a static executable, and that's what you're going to deploy in your pod. So there are a couple of open source projects that you should definitely take a look at. Occlum, and forgive the project folks if I mispronounce uh, any of these, Occlum is one, uh, Grameen is another, it used to be called Graphene. Um, but I think there are, it's important to note there are caveats, and as an attacker, you're thinking uh, these are attack points. Uh, some of the implementations may be works in progress. Um, you know, found a couple of, of example nuggets on, on GitHub, and some of them rely on more academic notions of how to verify. And there are a, a lot of attacks that are using things like return-oriented return programming, jump-oriented programming, to try to understand how memory is written uh, and, and what timing and try to get control of the environment. So not all of these open source wrappers have been hardened against those attacks and probably not many of them have been studied. And Occam and Grameen are, are certainly the ones that have been studied the most and used the most, but um, there, there's definitely some uh, fine print that you need to go through. And ideally, if you have the opportunity, review the code yourself. Uh, here's just a, a, a quick, over, I think uh, Grameen is on the left, Occlum on the right, but they basically uh, you know, work within the host. They have kind of an abstraction layer, and, and then they, you execute your executable that manages all of the processes. Um, they have a tool chain that takes your, your code and then verifies it, and uh, you can then deploy it in the Enclave. So there's another way to do it. It's kind of create a shim. So Enclavare uh, is an approach where you kind of create a shim. Uh, they call it run E or rune. And they allow you to use your, your containers, if they're OCI compliant, pretty much out of the box, right? So you can now just 
run Rune or run E uh, against your container and create an Enclave compatible uh, 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 container. And they also, like I say, they piggyback on Occlum and Grameen and uh, the Wasm. So uh, yeah, I think this one is a pretty easy way to get. If you have a pod application, you don't want to or can't do much refactoring, and you're not that much interested in the details of how the different SDKs and attestation plugins work, uh, this is a pretty convenient way to look at it. Again, the caveat there is now you're expanding your trusted computing base. So you're bringing in, for all of that convenience, you're bringing in more code that is susceptible to attack uh, so that you know, folks can analyze the way that things are, are written, how the O calls and E calls, are they patterned, and, and they can extract secrets if they do that level of attack. So another approach is Marble Run. Uh, and so they're trying to take the microservices approach, giving you a lot more functionality around managing the secrets, you know, you, all the attestation. Uh, it's really just you're, you're defining YAML adjacent, and it's uh, like any other microservices infrastructure. Uh, no code changes required, no special tooling required. Uh, and they can deploy Grameen and Occlum apps as well. So it's kind of a nice stack. Um, I think, again, the, the biggest concern I would have with this is that now you've added even more convenience and functionality and even more to your TCB. So it requires you to really think through what are the trade-offs of, you know, do you trust all of that code that's providing you that infrastructure? Do you really need a microservices approach for this critical application? Uh, or is this, you know, maybe something that is down the road? Hello. I'd say the, the last one um, I, I would take a look at is NARCs. Um, so in this case, they're have, taking your code. You don't have to make much code modification at all, if any, and you're cross-compiling that to, to WASM. Uh, so they manage all of the uh, functions for the O calls and the E calls. They're doing all the remote access station. Um, they've implemented pretty much everything you need to deploy your, your WASM app. The, the problem here, of course, is if you're not familiar with WASM, uh, if your application is not uh, organized so that you can quickly partition it into cross-compilable components, uh, this might not be an option for you. Um, I'd say you know, for fairly modular, small applications, this is a great idea. Uh, and I think uh, there's project, the project is making a lot of fast progress. I think they're not quite up to production standards. I think they themselves would, would note that in the documentation, but I think it's, uh, it's a, a way forward in the next couple of years. So I've given kind of an overview. This is my take on if I lay out what are the, what are the attributes we're looking for in, in a platform, and then we kind of overlay those approaches. You know, kind of on the left, uh, the SDK, the plugins you can use kind of off the shelf. Um, you know, you have to do everything yourself, and, you know, while there's... Um, you know, a very small trusted computing base, uh, you really have to do a lot of work, right? So you're kind of trying, I'm trying to find, as someone who's deploying these systems, I'm trying to find the balance between make it easy enough for me to run real world applications, but do it enough of the legwork to make sure that I'm confident and can attest that I have a, a trust, uh, trust computer base that I can, uh, I can uh, myself audit and verify. So I think if I kind of, my, my choice, and I think we talk about that a little bit. Oh, I'll, I'll come back to that, sorry. Um, so if you're thinking about this from a defense perspective, um, talk about that, you know, minimizing the trusted computing base. Um, you do, I would recommend that Intel and others have done some formal verification. So that's where you model the system and you use, you know, either higher order logic or symbolic logic to look at what the behavior of the system should be, and then you compare that to the behavior of the actual system. Uh, I would say for those open enclave, even the Occlum, um, Grameen, I think if they could benefit uh, greatly from using that formal verification approach, and you know, it's, it's not a silver bullet either. You still have to continue to do that every change. It's not going to find uh, concrete bugs in you know, code check-ins. It's going to really model the system and find fundamental design flaws. But I think it gives you a, a, le a level of... Uh, uh, integrity to the, to the design that you can be more comfortable using a particular solution. So on the hardware side, 
you know, the chip providers themselves are adding more control over the memory layout and memory access. You know, for, for those uh, return-oriented programming, jump-oriented programming attacks, you know, it's all about understanding memory writes and reads in a particular sequence or a particular timing and, and comparing that to um, trying to extract from that a signal that gives you the, the, the key or you know, branch information and extracting out uh, either the secrets or understanding more about the algorithm and the code that's running inside. So to, to, do, to prevent that, they are adding features. There's some software approaches to that, kind of a, a software supervisor that can check those calls and either add random delays and things like that, um, or just block, uh, uh, re reassign things altogether. Um, yeah, so there's, uh, Intel has TDX, it's their newer capability, and that's adding you know, different keying to the memory encryption. Um, and it's you know, adding more granularity to the uh, memory page encryption. Um, and it does have support on AKS. I, I will note that um, the AK, if you're running Kubernetes on Azure, they have a lot of support for all the tools that I've shown. Again, not affiliated with Azure, but uh, you, you will find it easier to do some of your prototyping on Azure using their confidential uh, AKS support. So let's talk a quick bit about compliance. Compliance, when I talk about compliance, I'm usually talking in the form of like a government standard or something like NIST, where you have to demonstrate that you've, your system meets certain security controls. So the, the security controls that I list here are from NIST 853, Rev 5, and they have different baselines, high, moderate, low. Usually for any kind of critical infrastructure or military system, you're gonna be looking at high baseline. And so they lay out specific requirements for a system. You know, you, you've got to isolate and protect memory. You've got to isolate processes. Um, and so all of the features we talked about earlier with enclaves really check these boxes. So um, it, it's not otherwise possible you, without dedicated HSMs or other specialized hardware. Uh, this makes it very easy to meet these in a, in a Kubernetes environment and at least you know, document how enclaves are, are being used to implement those controls. Um, there's another set of even more granular controls, which if, if you're, you're contracting with government agencies, they can layer on uh, specific controls that may not be in a particular baseline. So here, again, the formal, formal model for your um, verification is helpful. You're getting uh, non-modifiable executable, so it's, a lot of these boxes get checked by using enclaves. So where do we go from here? So this is this derived from an actual system build-out, um, and you know, for us, we have to look at it from the attacker's view and, and the defender's view. For us, you know, we really wanted to use things like Marble Run or NRX, or NRX um, but again, we were very concerned about the, the size and the scope of that TCB. So the other end of the spectrum, we, we didn't have the time, we didn't have the developer team to write to the raw SDKs and the plugins. So we kind of fell into that middle ground and, and are using, uh, testing both combination of the Occlum Grameen. And then, you know, we are looking at Inclavari. I think our, our current uh, inclination is to not use Inclavari, just given that extra level of uh, code that it adds with, I think, not, not that much convenience. Not to say that it's not a good project, it's just for us, we'd rather incur a little bit more of the pain uh, in verifying and understanding how things are implemented and do a little bit more of that work so that we can have an understanding of that trusted computing base. Um, so we will be posting kind of build out uh, updates and we'll be posting all of the designs and all the attack uh, models, all the attack scripts. We'll be posting that on our, our Twitter feed. You guys are definitely welcome to, to check it out and uh, take a look. And just, uh, how are we doing on time? Do we have enough time for questions? Great.
Yeah, so the, the question, did everyone hear the question? The question is about, uh, you're protecting the, the key, but what about the supply chain code that you're pulling in? So as, as you're pulling in libraries and open source into your uh, application, that is part of the, the trusted computing base that you're now relying on. So um, the, there's no real magic to how the enclave is gonna protect the supply chain. Uh, it will provide code integrity so that you know that the, the code that you've compiled into your application um, or that you've cross-compiled the WASM is the same code that you compile, but it's not going to, and, and then you know, when you load it into the enclave, it will verify cryptographically hash that it is that code. So you know that it hasn't been modified from the time you compiled it and into the time it's running in the enclave. But up until the point where you are compiling in that code, that's your responsibility, right? So, um, and I think that probably represents the largest and most fruitful attack surface. If I think of it as an attacker, you know, I can somewhat dismiss a lot of the, the hardware um, you know, without, I, I would say for a high critical system, I'm absolutely gonna put that on my list, but the low hanging fruit is to go after the supply chain, right? So I'm gonna try to introduce very subtle uh, timing uh, changes in open source libraries that nobody really looks at too closely. Um, so I might go attack their GitHub repos, I might attack their, um, their JavaScript packages. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna try to exploit those return oriented programming, jump oriented programming tricks and extract data out of the enclave using those open source bugs or, or ha malware hacks that I put into that open source library. So that's to me why I wanna minimize that as much as possible. And the, and, you know, the, the folks that you know, open enclave, you know, I think would probably be the safest route where you really have to scrutinize everything you're bringing in, but it just leaves a lot of work for you. Yeah, so the question is if the orchestrator and control plane should essentially be in the enclave as well, right? Um, so a couple of answers there. One, you know, just at a very high level, uh, there is a performance hit when you, when you work with these enclaves, right? So you're losing a lot of the memory optimizations, um, different levels of caching, you know, different, you know, hardware uh, performance optimizations. You may be losing a lot of operating system caching and performance tuning. So you have to consider what is the performance hit in, in using this. And if I just stick the whole database or whole you know, application stack and control plane and Kubernetes into the enclave itself, uh, you know, the performance hit is gonna be significant. Um, not to say it's impossible. Um, and, and certainly with those newer processors giving you more memory, it is possible. Um, Above and beyond performance, you've, you've got to look at why, right? So if, if you're following that attack tree and you're minimizing your trusted computing base, that's kind of at odds with then adding the whole control plane and the whole orchestrator in there as well. Um, you know, so do I need to do that? What's, what am I gaining by adding that in there? I don't trust the operator. That's explicitly part of our model. I don't trust the cloud operator. I don't trust the root users of the system. I don't even trust the board manufacturer. Um, the only thing I trust is that Intel or ARM chip. So everything else is about convenience, really, and you know, developer productivity. So I think it's just a trade-off. You, you, you want to minimize the amount of code that you have to either formally verify or you know, quasi-formally verify and scrutinize and do code audits and code reviews and lab tests, or whatever mechanism you're going to choose. But as you expand that into Kubernetes, I mean, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm helping the, the uh, SIG security group do the third party Kubernetes security audit. And that hasn't been done since 2019, right? So I you know, don't know what's gonna shake out of that, but I'm sure there are gonna be a few things. Um, the attackers, of course, are gonna be looking for every opportunity in every layer of Kubernetes to implant code that will enable those memory layout, memory timing attacks. And, so it just gives them a huge surface area. 
So I'd, I'd say for, if you find something kind of a moderate level of risk, it's, it's definitely something I'd consider. Um, but if you really, it's, you know, the nuclear missiles, I think it's too much convenience to trade off. All right. Thank you, Rob. Great. Thank you, everyone.